Here, Dr. Le Are you done miking them? What? Yeah, we're uh... Huh? You might want to go if you're finished miking them. Yeah, finish miking them. Okay, fine. Oh. So we're just going to get underway shortly. Sorry I'm late. The parking was absolutely wicked out there. <laughs> Only at JGH Mini Med School, before the school begins, you hear about the parking complaints, no tissues in the washroom, the lineup was too long. You don't hear this at other hospitals, only here. Welcome everybody to our sixth edition of the JGH Mini Med School. It's wonderful to see so many of you uh, come back here once again. I guess that means that so many of you have failed five previous sessions. <laughs> as have I as well. That's why I'm back here again as well. I failed the previous five. I learned today that uh, Mini Med School, the diploma, despite the fact that I've got five of them hanging, the only thing it was qualified me for was to give blood. So I gave blood today, <laughs> proudly so, uh, with my diploma in hand. So my name is Glenn Nashen. For those of you that I haven't had the uh, honor of meeting in the previous five years, I'm the Director of Public Affairs and Communications. I am your MC and your facilitator for uh, Mini Med School. Uh, fortunately, I have never graduated from medical school, so I will not be giving any of the lectures whatsoever, but it'll be my dubious honor to introduce our speakers and to uh, read off your questions and to uh, help you along and welcome you and try to uh, resolve any problems. Of course, we won't have any more problems. So uh, with that, uh, we'll go into a couple of announcements to, uh, to start off. For some of you, this will be uh, a reminder. First of all, if you got hot coffee, leave it outside next time. We don't want to have any accidents. It only takes a little flick of the wrist to burn the person in front of you, notwithstanding the fact that our emergency department is excellent. We do not need more patients, so we'll try to avoid any accidents. 
Uh, cell phones, if you have them, great time to take it out and hit silent or turn them off so we don't have to be disturbed by all of the uh, Habs ringtones and everything else that you've downloaded. Um, student ID tag. So you stood in line and it was a little bit of a hassle, I know, but uh, fortunately for uh, our repeat students, this is the last time that you'll be standing in line. We're only doing the lineup the first night. We will not be doing it again. You've got your ID tags that you're wearing and that is your laissez-passer to get you in here uh, each and every week. So in the future when you come, the doors will be open at 7 o'clock. Uh, our hospitality desk, so to speak, will be open uh, from about 6.45. We'll have some refreshments there, and you're welcome to come and to schmooze a little bit and to meet some of the uh, doctors and nurses and head nurses that will be presenting uh, to you and uh, to pick up some information over at the display. Uh, and we'll open promptly at 7 and allow you to, uh, to come in uh, just by showing your VIP pass that you're wearing around your neck. For those of you that purchase the parking pass, that's also around your neck as well and uh, keep it there so you don't come to us next week to tell us you lost it. You just have to show it to the parking attendant on the way out. If there's any glitches this first week, speak to myself or speak to Marisa. Where's Marisa? She's over here waving and we'll help you out with any of those, uh, any of those problems. You've got the black bag. Of course, I heard from 25 people on the way in. How do we wear this black bag? It's a little bit funny, so I will give you the demonstration. It is called a sling bag. You sling it over your right shoulder, under your left armpit. That much you know from your anatomy and physiology you learned in the first five years. You click it together and that's how you wear a sling bag. So it is yours to wear and uh, certainly open it up. There's a lot of great uh, little tools in there. Uh, most importantly for us is the evaluation form and so many of you filled it out in the previous years which we really appreciate. It's allowed us to uh, try to improve uh, on the sessions year after year and this year to bring uh, a real innovative and different kind of um, approach to, uh, to what we do here uh, at Minimed. Uh, I mentioned the, the other information about the doors opening. Um, let's see what else I have to mention in my housekeeping announcements here. Uh, the park, if you didn't buy the parking pass and you still want to park, what a great deal. For $20 you get to park your car six times in a hospital that so many people criticize being overpriced and under uh, place for uh, parking. For 20 bucks you get to bring it here six times in a row. You can't, there's no better deal in town, I'm telling you. So. Um, Sure, do that. Uh, washroom. Uh, 14 people came up to me, where's the washroom already? Shortcut. Out the door, turn left, you're there in seven seconds. There's no, and we have tissues that have already been put, put in there. That's not a problem as well. And at this point, I want to take just a moment before we get underway to uh, thank our sponsors. If it wasn't for our sponsors, we wouldn't be able to bring uh, such a magnificent uh, program to you at such a low cost, I might add. And I want to start off by welcoming uh, Connie Finelli, who's here from Pfizer Canada. Uh, Pfizer has been our uh, platinum stethoscope sponsor and a sponsor since the very first year, six sessions ago. And Connie's been us with us uh, since day one. So welcome, Connie. It's great to have you here. And we appreciate your support. I'd like to welcome, uh, second year back, our gold stethoscope sponsor. Of course, it doesn't give you any privileges as a, me a medical uh, you know, practitioner. It just gives you a, a gold stethoscope. But uh, we'd like to welcome Pietro Attori, who is here from TD Malash Monix uh, Insurance. And, uh, and uh, Pietro, I'm going to invite up in just a couple of minutes to, uh, to say a few wor words to you as well. Um, I'd also like to just take a moment to recognize uh, Costco Marche Centrale. They donated uh, all of the great refreshments that are outside, most of them anyhow, and uh, we appreciate their support very much. And last but not least, so many of you recognize him only as our doorman. He's so much more. I want to recognize Murray Guinness. Is Murray here? Where is he? Where is he? So, oh, wave. He's in my spotlight. I can't see him. Murray Guinness from Impeccable Printing. Murray has been responsible from very day one, six sessions ago, and he's printed up all of the pads of paper, the posters, um, our program booklets, everything that you've got that's printed, Murray has provided to us free of charge. And, we great, and not only that, he comes here as well to help us uh, in, cracks a little wisecrack, gets your, to know your name, and helps you out as well. So thank you very much uh, for that, Murray. And on we go to tell you about the DVD that we have on sale, not for $39, not for $25. <laughs> but call now for the low cost of just $19.99. Operators are awaiting to take your call. Uh, for those of you that haven't benefited from this incredible DVD, uh, we've dropped the price dramatically just for uh, our GAGH mini med school students. It's a fantastic thing. We've got uh, four of them in English, two of them in French. This one will be, uh, will be recorded as well. And uh, if you want to give it away, it makes a great stuffing stuff, uh, stocking stuffer for Christmas. We're only like 400 days away, so, or Hanukkah. Uh, so pick one up. I think it would be a great gift. 
And, um, well, hopefully you have no questions, because I'm not going to take them right now. I'm just going to remind you, at the end of the session, we start 7.30 promptly every week. There's a few minutes of uh, introduction. We'll have a five-minute uh, introduction each week of something we call a PSA, a public service announcement. And what it is is we've invited somebody from the hospital to speak to you for a maximum of five minutes to give you a little commercial break on some area of interest where you may get involved uh, hopefully as a volunteer, perhaps financially, uh, by way of a donation or a sponsorship, uh, something that may pique your interest and make you uh, a little bit more interested in the hospital, uh, other than being a patient, of course, because that we don't have to encourage you to, uh, to get involved with. So uh, we'll do that for about five minutes each session and then right into the uh, sessions. This year, dramatically different because this is the first time uh, in our history of Minimed and I can tell you with uh, over a hundred Minimeds being offered across North America it's the very first one where we're we've teamed together the nurses the head nurses and nurse practitioners and our uh, medical uh, physicians together to give you a different perspective on what goes on behind the scenes here at the Jewish General Hospital and I think it'll be a very interesting and, and uh, thought-provoking session and uh, of course you'll be the judge and you'll let us know at the end. So without further ado I'm going to ask uh, Pietro Atori to step forward and just give us a few announcements and, uh, and I welcome him from TD Insurance Malash Monix. Petro. <coughs> Good evening everyone. <coughs> Glenn, I may need uh, a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening everyone. Uh, I hope you had uh, not too much traffic to get here. Uh, on behalf of TD Insurance Malash Monix, uh, we would like uh, to thank you uh, for being here and we would, we're proud to sponsor the 2008 series of the May, uh, JGH Minimed School and we hope you enjoy your sessions and have a nice evening. Thank you very much Pietro, we'll take care of that cough later, leave your Medicare card on the way out. And without further ado and before we start I want to introduce you to a uh, special guest uh, speaker uh, to help introduce and kick off the uh, sixth series of uh, JJH Mini Med School, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Hartley Stern, a colorectal surgeon from Ottawa. He became the fifth executive director in the 74-year history of the Jewish General Hospital. He brings to this position extensive experience as an academic surgeon, a healthcare administrator, and an advocate for improvement in the healthcare system. Most recently, Dr. Stern served as Vice President of Cancer Services at the Ottawa Hospital, where he also played a pivotal role in the evolution of the hospital's regional, regional cancer care program. Previously, he served as Chairman of the Department of Surgery at the University of Ottawa and at the Ottawa Hospital. Dr. Stern was the Provincial Clinical Leader for Surgical Oncology at Cancer Care Ontario. He has also presided over the Canadian Oncology Society, the Canadian Society of Surgical Oncology, and the Integration Group of the Canadian Strategy for Cancer Control as, it's, uh, as it developed into a national council. And I can uh, tell you that uh, uh, Dr. Stern was lauded by the Mayor of Ottawa, the Premier of Ontario, for all of his achievements and accomplishments uh, in that province. And uh, his final uh, media uh, interview uh, on CFRA, I believe it was, or, or whatever, CFRB, CFRA, I'm, I've lost track, in Ottawa, uh, the uh, interviewer said that Ottawa's loss is Montreal's gain. So I'd like to introduce you to Montreal's newest gain, Dr. Hartley Stern. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, for those of you who are concerned about it, the rumors that uh, Glenn is leaving and joining the uh, Montreal Comedy Festival are not true. Um, despite his obvious uh, talents that I was not entirely aware of, uh, we are going to be able to retain him, I hope, for a long time to come. Um, Uh, I'm, I'm here to welcome you. This is really quite an extraordinary sight. I'm used to seeing a lot of people come into the hospital not looking so good. And uh, <laughs> this is the best looking group of patients and people that walked into the hospital I've seen yet. So I'm complimenting you on, on how well you look um, and, um, and the, the good sense that you've had to think about um, getting informed about your health care and to get an education. Uh, I can attest to the price being a good deal. My son was just admitted to medical school and I'm very pleased about that and I can guarantee you it's not 1999 that it's going to cost me over the next four years. Um, it, it, it is very true that the more you know about how your body works and how it will malfunction and how we are going to help it function again, the more you know about the hospital and how it functions, 
the more likely your journey, should you need one in this hospital, is going to be easier. There is abundant evidence. This is not bubamice. This is true, unequivocal evidence in the medical literature that the informed patient has a shorter journey in the hospital, a more relaxed journey in the hospital, and a much more likely uh, chance that they escape the hospital feeling um, like they've recovered satisfactorily and feeling satisfied about their experience. We do have wonderful doctors, nurses, and allied health professionals to look after you. And traditionally, the model of care in which doctors and nurses work together to look after you has served the public extremely well. The new model is one in which the doctors, the nurses, and the patient work as a partnership uh, to get you well again. And I'm absolutely convinced that that is the right direction to take. And I would uh, congratulate the Jewish General Hospital on its initiative to create something so unique and so unbelievably well attended, I'm astounded by the audience, um, that you are taking ownership of your own health care needs. There is an enormous amount of health care information on the internet, in books, talking to your nieces and nephews, friends who've all had this kind of um, experience. It's not the lack of information that's available, it's the filter of that information that is what you require. So this kind of school in which the information has come from our doctors and nurses together, that is the first time we've done that, to actually put that all together, I gather, is that correct? So you'll get lectured from both sides. Gives you the kind of filter of information that you can't get from just looking on the net and doing a search or from asking a friend. That is, uh, you know, for everything else there's MasterCard. For this, um, you cannot, um, improve the chances of you getting through a healthcare experience better than having information that is filtered through the, uh, through the eyes, ears, and lectures of our professionals. Um, in, um, in I gather in the way the course works is a new experience for me. There will be a new topic each time and the lectures are to be uh, geared at a level that are informative, understandable, uh, educating, educative, educative, that's not quite correct, but educational, and uh, rewarding to you. I, I personally want to thank the doctors and nurses. It's not like they don't work very hard already uh, to volunteer their time, to come in the evenings, to do this kind of work. Um, you know, they do have wives, children, and, and uh, husbands uh, to be at home with, and they are giving it up to be with you, and I know you will show your appreciation at some point during this course. I also would like to thank our sponsors from uh, Pfizer and from Alash Monix uh, TD. Um, it is uh, a wonderful sense of returning something to the community uh, by helping us uh, through this course. And in particular, I want to thank um, uh, our resident uh, comedian and uh, generally great guy um, who has superb organizational skills to help uh, make this happen, and in particular, Marisa Rohde, um, who has uh, coordinating this event. And I know that you will join me in thanking the team uh, that is uh, sacrificing uh, to give you the best educational experience we can. So thank you for coming and thank you to the team uh, for getting all the work done. Thank you very much, Dr. Stern. Uh, just for your information, I did leave three times for the Comedy Fest. They sent me back. They, it didn't work out there, so I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'd also like to welcome a few other people. Uh, we have the president of the uh, auxiliary of the Jewish General Hospital, Rona Green, here. I'd like to welcome Rona. We have the director of the uh, JGH Auxiliary, uh, Nancy Rubin, here as well. So welcome to Nancy. We have uh, an interesting group of students from PSW and PAB, uh, about 21 uh, that came here from LaSalle. They're sporting their uniform up here on the left side, my left side, your right. I want to welcome all of them. These are 21 students. 21 students who are studying, as I understand it, to, to be uh, orderlies, nurses, aides, and uh, this is part of the education process, so uh, I hope this proves to be beneficial to you as well. And finally, I want to make uh, one special welcome to Mrs. Klein, who's been here for a couple of years, and I understand next month we'll be celebrating her 101st birthday, so <laughs> welcome back. I, Mrs. Klein, I hope you continue to fail and return to this uh, course. For many more years, bis a hundred and svansik, as they say. So welcome once again. And uh, with that, we're going to move on to 
uh, Rosie Johnson, who is going to deliver tonight's uh, public service announcement. Uh, Rosie is the co-chair of the Humanization of Care Committee. I know that many of you learned a little bit about the humanization of care in the past, and uh, Rosie is a relatively new uh, co-chair, also nursing coordinator of the Nurses uh, Resource uh, Center, and Rosie will speak to us for a couple of minutes about uh, humanization of care. So please welcome Rosie. Wow, good evening. So as Glenn said, I'm Rosalie Johnson. I'm the coordinator of the Nurse and Resource Center. As well, I co-chair the hospital's Humanization of Care Committee. And so on behalf of the Humanization of Care Committee, I would like to just give you a bit of information about the work we do and some of the projects that we have initiated. Uh, this committee uh, was formed in the 1990s by Mr. Morton Brownstein, and he was our first um, chair. And uh, over the years, we've had many impressive uh, chairs of this committee, including Dr. Eddie Lang, Dr. Yvonne Steinhardt, uh, Mimi Goldenberg, and Ms. Leah Feldman, who is um, my co-chair currently. This is a committee that is uh, volunteer based on volunteerism, and we have approximately 33 members, 50-50 uh, really the community and uh, from within the hospital. And what exactly do we do as a humanization of care committee? We try to um, see the areas that are difficult for the patients as they navigate through our systems. And we see where we can um, create a project or implement some plans that will make it easier and hopefully improve the outcome of the patients as they go through the system. Um, what we like to say is that we do not uh, tell the physicians or the nurses or the professionals how to do their jobs. It's not the art of medicine, it's the art of caring that we look at and some of our projects that we have been involved in, I think will demonstrate that quite nicely. It's a committee that meets uh, once a, a month, and um, we try very hard to include um, families, patients, people who've had experiences um, that they can share with us and that they can help us to um, um, improve um, when other patients come into the system. We have a nice mission statement, um, which um, I'd like to read to you because I think it's very important. It says that the Humanization of Care Committee is dedicated to the integration, enhancement, and promotion of the patient-centric care within all aspects of the Jewish General Hospital. By ident identifying the points of contacts of the patients and their families within the hospital, and initiating and uh, monitoring patient-centric projects which improve these points of contact, the Humanization of Care Committee advances and supports the philosophy of the patient-centric care uh, as a core element of the hospital's practices and procedures and systems. Um, I, I'd like to just share with you a few of the projects that we have developed and you'll understand a little bit better when I say that it's the art of care and, and not the, the art of medicine that we um, try to bring across. <coughs> um, those of you who've been in the hospital will probably have seen the doc Dr. Clown. They are two um, clowns that pretends that they're doctors and they, they visit throughout the hospital. They visit the patients that are in the dialysis area. These patients, um, naturally, um, they're a captured audience. They're in a dialysis chair for a very long period of time. Um, their environment doesn't change. Um, there's not much to um, make it a little bit easier for them. But when these clowns come around, and I say that in a really nice way, uh, when they come around, they really do break up the monotony of that area. As well, they visit the patients who are in isolation, they visit patients who are in the emergency room for a long period of time, and they, I think what they do is they, they change the mindset of our patients and our families, and they help the time to go by a little bit uh, faster. Um, I should say that we, although we develop projects, because we are a volunteer committee, we do not have a budget to man them. So we try to get uh, someone else to um, take over and to bring forward these projects. And we've been very lucky to have the, uh, the ladies auxiliary who have um, taken over quite a few of our projects and have continued to uh, support them. And it's our patients that benefit from them. We also have uh, another project that I really like, and it's called the uh, Greeters Project. And what is the Greeters Project? Um, if you walk into the hospital, like Glenn's um, opening scene where you know, he's walking down the hallway, there's a lot of people. And if you're here during the daytime, it's very confusing. And so um, you know, I will be standing just by the photocopy machine, and you'll have a, a patient or family member that will come up to me, and they'll say, how do I get to the test center? And I'll say, well, you go down the hall, you turn right, you make a left, you go straight down, and then you turn again. And the person's looking at you and they're blank because you're giving them information that 
they'll never remember or they'll be so confused about it, they'll be lost before they get there. And they'll leave me and I'll look around and they go to the next person that seems to work in the hospital and they'll ask them the exact same question again. So what's nice about our greeters is they go one step further. If you go up to them and you say, how do I get to the test center? They'll take you by the hand and they'll take you to the test center. And that's just such a relief. And I think that's what I mean by the art of caring. It decreases the anxiety, it decreases the confusion, and I think it just makes things so much nicer for the patients and families if you have someone that can do that for them. It's one less thing that they have to worry about. So we're really quite proud of this uh, project. Um, there's another project that we're also equally proud of, and that's the uh, Pager project. And I don't know if anyone here have had the opportunity to use it, but um, let's see if I can explain it to you in an easy way. You, you, your family member comes in for surgery, and they go, they're in the operating room, and you're sitting down, you're waiting because you want to speak to the surgeon. But you don't want to leave to go to the washroom. You don't want to leave to go and get something to eat. You don't want to get up and you just stretch your legs because the minute you do, that surgeon is coming out and you will miss him. Um, so this pager, what it allows you to do is borrow a pager, and about 20 minutes before the surgery is finished, will page you so you can come back and you can meet with the surgeon. So you can get up, you can go outside, you can you know, get something to eat, you can relax for a little bit without worrying that you will not see the surgeon when, the, when, when it's time. So again, that's a very nice way of supporting our families, decreasing the anxiety, decreasing the stress of uh, missing the surgeon or not finding out what's going on. Okay, so these are some of the projects that we get involved uh, in. I'll tell you a few other smaller ones. Um, we also, we're involved in the wheelchair. That's the big orange one way at the top, the wheelchair project. And that's just to help bring more wheelchairs into the system, identify them, make it available. When you come through the front door, you don't have to search all over just to get a wheelchair to get someone to a test. If you're on the unit and someone needs to be discharged, you don't have to walk all over the hospital just to find a wheelchair. And it seems like a simple thing, but it wasn't. <laughs> so now we've, uh, we have a lot of wheelchairs. It's easier. We've gotten really good feedback from patients and families and staff to say it's so much easier now to get around in this hospital, especially if you need a wheelchair. Um, uh, we have the Benjamin Friedman newsletter, and that's an ethical um, newsletter that comes out four times a year. And uh, any staff member can write um, in this um, letter. We've got the humor cart, which is the ability to borrow a movie. And again, the ladies' auxiliary is uh, managing that as well as the arts and craft um, um, project. So, you know, if someone is in their room, they're bored, they want something to do, we can uh, provide some. And, relief from the boredom for them. Not everyone can afford a TV, so you know you can, you can rent a movie. It's a comedy. We, you know, we know what they say about humor and uh, healing, so um, we're happy to be able to support that. We also have our Humanization of Care Week, and each year we put on uh, three series of um, rounds. We support uh, nursing grand rounds, we support uh, medical grand rounds, and we always put something on for the community in the evening time. And um, they've been very successful and um, well attended, and we're quite proud of that. Um, I think that's that. Um, we're always looking for volunteers. We always need people to help us to develop projects or to carry projects forward or to, uh, you know, help us tell us what some of your issues are so that we could work on them. So if anyone is interested in hearing more about the Humanization of Care Committee, please feel free to give your name to Glenn or Marissa and um, they will get it to us and we can send you some information. And. Um, that's about all the time I have to give you. So please enjoy your evening, and I hope uh, it's a very fruitful evening for you. Thank you very much, Rosie. A little uh, gift for you, just for showing up. You get this great little bag filled with paper. So thank you very much. That's great. Uh, just to uh, last housekeeping announcement before we move on with the evening, uh, especially for the, uh, the newbies uh, in the audience, you have a, a pad and paper. Uh, or a pencil, I should say, in or a pen or whatever you have in your bag, it, it writes, and uh, and you have a pad. And if you want to ask questions, we don't ask questions during the actual lecture. Uh, as soon as the lecture is over, we'll have a period of time which will end religiously, nine o'clock every week. And um, uh, write down your question, write as clearly as possible. Otherwise, we'll not be able to read it. And then we'll put it to uh, our our guest speakers for this evening. So without uh, further ado, we're going to go into an introduction of our guest speakers this evening. There's not much time for our guest speakers this evening, but uh, well, you know, 
We'll just cut it short, no problem. So first, I want to introduce you to Dr. Denny Laporta, who has been chief of the JGH Department of Adult Critical Care since 1999 and has been practicing pulmonary and critical care at the JGH since 1984. He is medical director of the hospital's respiratory therapy service. Dr. Laporta received his MD from McGill University and completed postgraduate training at McGill and at Notre Dame, Royal Victoria, and St. Mary's Hospitals. At McGill, he is an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine, and at the MUHC, he is a member of the Division of Critical Care. Dr. Laporta is president of the Quebec Society of Intensivists and member of the Specialty Committee for Critical Care Medicine of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. As well, I'd like to introduce you to his partner this evening, Jackie Raboy Thaw, who has been an interim nurse coordinator in the intensive care unit since 2007, having joined the ICU nursing staff of the JGH in 1986. She received her degree as a registered nurse from Vanier College, completed a critical care nursing course at Ryerson University, and earned a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing from the University of British Columbia. Ms. Thaw served as a member of Concordia's University Health Services nursing staff, specializing in asthma, travel health, uh, vaccination and triage in university student population. She received the Canadian Nurses Association certification in critical care nursing. Ms. Thaw is a member of the Order of Nurses of Quebec, the College of Nurses of Ontario, the New York State Board of Nursing, and the Canadian Association of Critical Care Nurses, as well as the Quebec Coalition of Intensive Care Nurses. Please welcome tonight's lecturers, Jackie Raboy Thaw and Dr. Denny Laporta. Uh, is it on? Yes. Are you on? Am I on? Are you on? Yes. I'm on. Uh, I'm also impressed that uh, we have quite quite a, a turnout. That we usually don't have this many when I speak at the Block Amphitheater. So we're, there's something about <laughs> Jackie that's and, and everyone else that is making this no. uh, very enthusiastic. So I think with further ado, uh, we should start. Uh, I think so. We uh, do the slides, uh, Glenn. Do we do slides? Ah. Okay, so Jackie, want to take it away? She's not okay. exactly how we... Now what do we have here? <laughs> no? Let's get to the first slide. Can you do that? No? Nope. This is it. That's it? Okay. Nope. That's okay, we'll wing it, right? Yeah. We can do that. Good. Tonight our goal was to take you into the ICU as we know it, to take you behind the monitors. So we know that many people walk into the ICU, the intensive care unit, and are taken aback by all of the paraphernalia that's there, all of the tools that we work with, all of the equipment. And really, for us, for the nurses working there, for the physicians working there, it's home. We live there. There's no place that we feel safer, almost than being in the ICU. So we want you to be able to understand why we feel so safe there. What's so special about this place where we are? So where is the ICU? In this hospital, the ICU has two physical locations. It's the Nick's Medical Surgical ICU, not coronary care, different. We are on the third floor. We're right over there where the star is. The third floor, actually, right up above us here. Okay, That's where we are. We have ICU-1 and ICU-2. They're both exactly the same type of place, same patient population. Um, this is just the front doors of ICU-1. So now we're going to take you inside. So we're going to open the doors and go through. Who are we? We're a group of about 100 nurses, 12 orderlies, uh, 10 unit agents, 8 resident doctors per month, easily eight attending physicians, um, a group of respiratory therapists that are probably about 20 strong. We have a physiotherapist that works with us. We have social workers. We have two clinical nurse specialists and a nurse educator. We're a big group of people. We have a pharmacist with a pharmacist technician working with us. We're many, many people. We use the services of the rabbi. We use the services of occupational therapy. 
We use many different people. You give me the next slide. There we are. Here's more of our team and our group. We do everything from the orderlies go and set up their pumps. We round at the bedside. What happens with our team is that we see our patients as people that happen just to be in the bed. And we try and work together, all of us, the nurses with the doctors and the rest of our team, to take care of this person, always being very cognizant that this person could be our own mother, our own father, our own sister or brother, our family member. What the ICU used to be. What do you think of that? All right, what a change. Now, this does not look like an ICU, but if you were in the 1940s during a polio epidemic, and these were iron lungs in a Harvard yeah. All ward. This was during the influenza epidemic in the 1918 range. Mm -hmm. This was in Kansas. So this was all on our continent. And so critical care started um, because of uh, epidemics. <laughs> and there was a, a need to concentrate uh, expertise, equipment, people uh, in locations that allowed you to do more, to do things better, <coughs> and to do them quickly. And we think that that heritage is uh, what has carried us to evolve to, for example, this is more, this is older equipment, uh, but this is now someone who has a kidney machine. So al although now this is not a respiratory infection anymore, we've added one organ system. Uh, then it gets a little messier, it can get messier when there are other organs failing, there is more equipment. This is not the average ICU patient, but this is what it can become. I think and what's now, important is that last slide. What I was told, at least, when my mother walked in to visit one of my relatives was, oh, that's what it looked like to them. To me, it looked completely different. So there's a really mm -hmm. interesting change. That's true. Yes. Here it looks a little more, a little less cluttered. Uh, there's a monitor, a ventilator, and this is someone who is uh, after trauma, who um, is uh, arranged in a, in a fairly standard way to allow uh, people to work in an organized way uh, to be more efficient. So uh, what, what I would say is the, the ICU is a place and it's a concept. And it's a place where if, uh, equipment um, uh, and uh, work processes and people with expertise uh, find a way to work um, efficiently together to be able to uh, allow the hospital to function and to move in or to move out uh, when the need occurs. In terms of the concept, uh, our mission is to be able to treat the most people who are critically ill um, as well as we can, people who we feel uh, have a chance of getting better. Um, and the more, th if we can do this um, efficiently, that is in an area like ours, uh, then we can help the hospital even better. Now, what is being critically ill? Um, it's really someone who needs care beyond what can be handled on a ward, hmm. on a hospital ward. And it, it's, it remains a very broad definition that is uh, identified on a case-to-case -case basis. But certainly, it's a question of how, how specialized, how much, how intense the amount of care, either diagnostic or therapeutic care. So here's our question for you. Knowing what you know about ICU, what do these people have in common? Okay, I'll show you a few different pictures. Let's see if I can do this. There we go. Okay, keep going. I have some more pictures for you. What do these guys all have in common? What do you see when you look at these people? Right? Love, smiling people, families, oh, back into the light. What they have in common is they're all ICU patients. These people all, at one point or another, have been through the ICU. Hmm. There's some pretty young people up there. Yeah. So critical care and intensive care nursing, intensive care medicine, 
is more than just taking some care of somebody who's over a certain age. It can be anybody, which is why it's so important to us that we know how to speak to you and how to care for you, the family, as well as our patients. So anybody could be critically ill. So we have some case studies for you. We'll give you a few examples. Um, a 54-year-old man brought in by ambulance because he was drowsy, high fevers, and difficulty breathing. The emergency staff diagnosed a severe pneumonia. It's so serious that he needs uh, intubation. There's a tube placed into his lungs. This is his x-ray, and this is what a normal chest x-ray would look like. So all the air, the black, is, is this is all pneumonia. All there. Mm. The ICU was consulted because the patients remain critically ill for more than a few hours, and they have to be moved somewhere else. The emergency room has a lot of incoming patients. So he's transferred to the ICU for care and management. That's one case. A 75-year-old woman comes uh, for elective heart surgery because she has a blocked heart valve that, if not treated, will eventually endanger her life. From the operating room, she's transferred to the ICU because the risk of post-operative complications after cardiac surgery uh, are <coughs> present for a certain period of time. And she remains there until she is off life support and her condition now allows um, ward management because it's not critical anymore. A third case, a 70-year-old man is brought into the emergency room with severe abdominal pain. He's diagnosed as having a perforated intestine. His condition deteriorates rapidly and is quickly transferred to the operating room where he has a definitive surgery. Immediately after surgery, he's transferred to the ICU for ongoing resuscitation, stabilization, and post-operative care. In the last case, we, a young man with, uh, hospitalized with acute leukemia. Um, he gets chemotherapy and um, develops infection, and the ICU is consulted because he's in shock uh, because of this infection. He's transferred and he's stabilized in the ICU. Now, the situation deteriorates over the next two weeks and then slowly improves so that he can be transferred after a month of ICU stay back to the ward. So these are examples of where people come from, what they can have, um, and people we have, we have treated. What they have in common, they had an acute reversible illness that benefited from being treated in a certain area with certain equipment, with certain people who could make the difference. And that could be any one of us. How about the equipment and procedures? You'll know we talked about intubation. There's a, a tube that can be placed into the lung that um, when you, you place it in a specific way with a laryngoscope, allows you to breathe for the person, take the load off breathing, and it helps to stabilize someone. We sometimes use a bronchoscope for this. And here's a respirator. There was an example of one yeah. in the hallway before. That's right. I want to tell you something. When we have a patient who we intubate, these patients require medication because intubation hurts. It does. It's, it's like, think of having a really sore throat. A really sore, you know, you're trying to swallow and a, that's what it feels like. So we don't take it lightly when we have to intubate somebody. We know that it's sore for them. But we also know that we can give them medication to get them through it. And they can communicate, even though they won't be able to talk while they have their, their tube in, they still can be awake, they still can communicate, they can still blink with their eyes, they can still do many other things, they can write if they, if they are up to it. And we, we benefit from this type of interaction. And in that way, the patient themselves is not always as afraid. So we can explain, they don't lose their hearing. It's just they can't talk until we take the tube out again. Okay? Ah. So these are the other things that you're going to see when you come into the ICU. You're going to see all kinds of pumps, all kinds of different, they gave me a pointer, let's see if I can use it. Um, you're going to see all kinds of different pumps. Now if you see a plethora of pumps at the top of somebody's bed, does that mean that they're more sick than you thought? No, not really. 
we put all of our medication and all of our just our plain intravenous lines on a pump. It allows us to be able to give our patients an accurate amount of liquid. And it allows us to know that it's running exactly as we programmed it, not more, not less. And remember, in a critical care patient, they change their situation rapidly. So this is one of the ways that we allow to make sure that the volume is precise. So it doesn't mean the person's more sick. It just means that we're monitoring their fluid levels. This is an example of a specialized catheter that uh, can be inserted in the operating room or the ICU. And it's a catheter, it's a yellow, uh, it happens to be yellow, it's a catheter, this is the sheath. And it, it uh, enters, it's entered through the vein uh, within the heart chambers and into the, uh, the vessels of the lung. And it happens to uh, be able to measure the flow of the cardiac output, the flow of blood, and make other measurements to be able to precisely uh, uh, monitor the heart. And it helps us for diagnosing and for treating people with heart and lung problems. OK, this next piece of equipment you're going to see, it's called an arterial line. We call it an art line. Um, what it does is that it gives us a constant blood pressure reading. The cannula here goes right into the person's wrist. So you usually see it attached here with a bit of tape. What that does is it shows us on the monitor here in red what the person's blood pressure is at any given moment in time. And interesting enough, your blood pressure fluctuates at any moment in time. So we can watch it and we can treat right away based on this. This doesn't hurt somebody when it's in at all. An infrared balloon is a um this is another catheter placed in the, the major artery of the uh, body, which is the aorta. And it's uh, really neatly timed so that with the heartbeat so that it, it offloads the heart. So it helps a failing heart. It's often used around cardiac surgery in the coronary unit. And uh, the patients we get are, are, this is really for <coughs> cardiac problems. And most of our patients are after, after or before cardiac mm -hmm. surgery who, who get this. And it doesn't hurt either. OK. And then we've got over here, excuse me, is our new dialysis machine. There's two types of dialysis that you can do. One is the dialysis department brings up their equipment. And the other one is one that we can do at the bedside. And that's this. The nurses here run it. It's called CVVH. Um, and the whole purpose of it is to be able to filter the person's blood when the person is no longer in a condition to be able to do it themselves. That's a very simple, simple thing. It's a temporary treatment. Um, it requires a lot of manpower, but the results are spectacular when it's indicated. Over here, we have our fancy new beds. They turn into chairs. Um, they <laughs> go up, they go down. They're very easy to push. The mattresses are a special therapeutic surface because people are in bed for a long period of time. It hurts your bum. <laughs> so when we turn people, they have their special mattress, and it really helps them a lot. As I said, our ICU patients, they're not always out of it. They could be very much awake, just having the right amount of medication so that they're comfortable and they're getting better. And that's, how, that's our goal. We wanted to show you a, a brief uh, outline of our statistics so you get a sense. We happen to have number since 1983, so you have 25 years of experience. Not all mine. Wow. <laughs> um, we, these, the blue is the total number of admissions. And you'll notice that we were staying below 600 until the cardiac surgery program started, which uh, all the little hearts. And this uh, uh, really created an expansion in our ICU. And our admissions have been going up ever since. Uh, and lately, uh, a decrease. Uh, for reasons that I'll show you in a second. But in a sense, uh, our patients have been becoming sicker and staying somewhat longer. Not all of them, but enough where um, our capacity is fairly fixed. And so we haven't been able to admit as many patients. During the course of uh, the evolution of the cardiac surgery program, we've admitted more patients. And they have um, stuttered somewhat and decreased a little bit lately also. And these are the other patients, the non-cardiac surgery and patients with medical diagnoses. So we admit currently a little over 1,000 patients a year. The uh, daily average of occupied beds is 
in the 14 patients on the average. Some days we run 16, 17, 18. Mm -hmm. Remember, that's an average. It's an average. So we this can have 18. That's busy. And the severity of illness, uh, using one score that's well accepted, has increased, as you can see, over the years. So the patients who are admitting are sicker than they used to be. And there are more patients staying uh, at more than one week. So if we just look at patients who are in the ICU more than one week, there are more patients staying longer. It's another gauge of, of people being ill, having diseases, more complicated illnesses that mm -hmm. require more complicated care. Yeah. Jackie? Uh, to tag on to what you were saying, our patients are sicker. Our patients are undergoing operations that 20 years ago they never would have had. They never would have had the blessing to live as long as they are. So really we're looking at medical technology at its best and nursing has had to come along to be able to meet that challenge as well. So as I've worked in the ICU for many years, what's happened in nursing itself is that nursing has progressed and we've gone from being the yes sir, yes sir to the doctor to equal partners in care. And that's very important, that's extremely significant. We're looking at nurse-doctor relationships and how each specialty can work together to improve the quality of the patient. The patient's <coughs> life, the patient's recovery, the patient's experience. And most recently, we've been able to add in the family as well, because there's a lot of research that shows that if the family is able to comprehend, to understand what's going on there with this patient, not only in the ICU but everywhere, the family can get it. And the family can support the patient. The patient feels more secure, more of the patient's energy than can go to getting better. And then everybody does better because the patients get better and they get out of the hospital sooner. And that's what it's about. So what's so special about us? We've become one of the first ICUs to be able to really transition and have the nurses participate actively with the physicians in working on the patients themselves. The nurses have active input. The nurses, because they're at the bedside 24 hours a day in variety of shifts, day after day after day, they have a lot of instinct and they know through their critical thinking skills that there are issues with patients and they bring them to the physicians and we work together to solve it. Here you've got three different pictures and they're very unique to, well, here our, our unit. Here's one of the nurses with one of our cardiac surgery patients. She's been with us for quite a while, this patient. And she really got better a lot because of the nurses encouraging her to do her deep breathing, to do her coughing, working with the physiotherapy, getting them involved, and having this partnership with the physicians who are with us to be able to prescribe the right treatments. That helped a lot. Over here, we have a fantastic program. This is Joanna Bailey. She is a <laughs> clinical nurse specialist in a program called the Adler Shainer Patient and Family Support Program. What Joanna does um, is she is able to meet with the families and work with them on any concerns that they have. She's a nurse. She doesn't work bedside. She works with the families. Families sometimes have questions when they come out of the ICU. The doctors and the nurses who are busy taking care of the loved one have given information. And the family walks out of our double doors and says, uh, I got it, I think, until somebody else gives them another story. Then they get mixed up. Joanna is there to be able to untangle this for them and then to go back and re-verify information if they need to. Not everybody's so forthright and outspoken. And this bridge that has been created has helped the communication between the families, the staff, um, the patients incredibly. So it's just an extra step we have and that's how the care we give gets a little bit more humanized by adding that extra person in there. Our last slide is, is one of our patients who was with us for a long time as well. He has a trach, actually. It's right over there. So he has a breathing tube. He's on a breathing machine. He's on a ventilator. And he's able to communicate and talk. And we offer them boards 
different letter boards, different ways to write. These are the people that the nurses and the physicians get the most attached to, these guys over here. Because they're the ones that we can actually give to, they give back. And this is really talking about what critical care is today. 20 years ago, this guy wouldn't have made it. And we're blessed with being able to get to know him a little bit. And our collaboration, we all work very closely. This is a, one of our morning reports where we've got my esteemed colleague here and two of the assistant head nurses at the front desk of the ICR, our old front desk actually, we're under renovations right now. And um, they take the morning when they come in and they work out their bed situation. How many patients do we have right now? How many people can we afford to admit from the operating room? Is there somebody in emergency? How many nurses do I have coming in? Have I had any sick calls? Okay, and then we shuffle it around, and we shuffle it around a good six, seven, eight, ten times a day in order to be able to take in as many people as we can and to nurse as many patients as we can, bearing in mind that some people just have to come. They're just so sick, they need to come to us. So they come. This is our caring. This is the best part about nursing in the ICU because the nurses have the chance to sit down and hold hands with the patients and just offer them that little reassuring piece that makes a difference. And that's the satisfaction. There you go. We communicate with these little portable telephones. Um, they help us being able to, there we go, being able to talk to each other between the two units. They help us being able to reach the doctor like this if we need to, if he's not in the unit, or if he's with another patient on the other side. There you go. These are just faces of our unit. These are people helping and working. It's a very intense place for all of us. But I think that's what makes it so special and so much of a home, is because not only do we reach out to each other, we have to, but we reach out to our families that are there too. Because if we can make it just a little bit better for you guys, then we've done our job and we've done it well. We want to talk about our partners, that is our extended team. We talked about our team uh, at the bedside. And I would add uh, to the uh, doctors and nurses, I would add all the other professionals who work around uh, the patient, uh, the, pa the people that Jackie mentioned before. Uh, and that includes the orderlies, the assistants, uh, the VAs, etc. Uh, it really forms a team. Uh, when someone gets very ill, there are no job descriptions. The descriptions are the ones that are determined at that time, and everyone does uh, basically helps in whatever capacity they can. Uh, when you leave the boundaries of the ICU, the partnership around Montreal, Quebec, the country, are extensions of this, and these are really extended partners. And it gives us the support to know that we're doing the right thing to our patients. So within uh, McGill, um, the other ICUs, uh, we have fairly close ties with them. We know what they're doing. We know how we think. We compare notes. Uh, we often even uh, help each other out when uh, there is overflow uh, for patient care. Uh, within the province of Quebec, there is the, the uh, group of uh, critical care nurses uh, that are a, a very strong interest group, and they do a lot of educating, and the Society of uh, Intensive Care Doctors, of which uh, I uh, am president. And we have fairly close ties, again, as to comparing notes. What are we doing? Are we trying to act in a concerted way? Uh, we have common problems. Out of the province, there, um, there is a Canadian initiative that is very um, um, high profile. It's the Safer Healthcare Now, and it's uh, uh, under the auspices of the Canadian Patient Safety Institute. And um, there are uh, teams of uh, preventive interventions to prevent pneumonia in the ICU to prevent infections from catheters. It's, it's largely preventative strategies that, uh, for which there's evidence, like Dr. Stern was saying, that there's evidence that someone who's well-informed will do better. Well, uh, if we uh, are informed as uh, caregivers that certain ways to practice will prevent complications, mm -hmm. then we try very hard to do them with a team. And uh, there's a collaborative uh, group that's associated with this that we uh, are, in fact, faculty members of. And we, we help other ICUs, and we're helped ourselves by this. 
Also within McGill, uh, we wanted to highlight also the McGill Simulation Center, which was created uh, a little over a year ago, uh, of which we're active members. And these are, uh, simulation training is an education tool to help people um, go through situations uh, before they happen. And it's not unique to medicine. Simulation is, is a tool that's used in every field, I think, of learning. And more recently in medicine, it's taken a higher profile, partly because the technology, the technology is able to uh, hit certain elements of our decision making and of our problem solving um, in, a, in a more structured way. So we can assess people and we can, we can learn and improve uh, in a more controlled way so that when the situation occurs, people have a framework. So this McGill Simulation Center is uh, another one of our partners uh, in training. Yeah. This is a picture of somebody who was very, very near and dear to us. Um, Al Spanier was responsible for the ICU at the Jewish. He, in so many ways, he was responsible for growing a group of excellent physicians and amazing nurses. And this presentation is in memory of him and a bit of a tribute to his foresight, his vision, his belief that not only physicians had to be excellent in what they do and what they believe, but that nurses and Every single partner that stepped foot in his ICU had to be in Cracker Jack, top performance, able to go, ready to know, type of beat. That's what he believed in, and that's what he passed on to all of us. And that's what we'd like to pass on to you. Insist on the best. Listen to what you have to hear. And think. And that's our message to you. Thank you for your time. So thank you very much to both of you. We're going to turn up the lights now. And this is, uh, gets to our interesting point. Is this on now? Can you hear me well? Yeah? I can hear okay, you. Okay, good. So uh, let's bring up the lights and uh, so everyone can see their, uh, their notepads. Don't go away just yet. There's no hockey game tonight. You're not in a rush. And we've got you as a captive audience for 31 more minutes. So uh, take out your pad of paper, start printing out your questions very clearly. I want to thank Dr. Laporta. I want to thank uh, Jackie Raboy Thaw very much. I have a little gift for both of you while you're standing here. Thank you. In, uh, as Dr. Stern said, in a grateful appreciation for uh, coming here, for sharing uh, some information. A gift for you, Jackie. Thank you. A gift for you, Denny. Thank you very much. Very and uh, on your behalf. Yes. So at this point, uh, this is where we invite you to get into a little bit of Q&A, a little bit of a discussion. So I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Laporta, I'm going to invite Jackie uh, Rabbi Tha to come stay up here. I'll grab the cordless and I'm going to go over there. I'm going to read some of your questions and uh, we will be finished, uh, whether uh, we like it or not, we'll be finished at 9 o'clock. And uh, in the future when, uh, when we have um, too many questions, what we will do is we will uh, post some of the questions to the website. We'll get uh, the doctors and, uh, and the nurses to uh, respond to some of these questions so we can get to uh, all of them as best as possible. So uh, let the questions begin. Uh, maybe while I'm waiting for them to come down and we have uh, Marisa and Stephanie and Henry and Murray all around here ready to grab your questions. Uh, maybe we'll start off by uh, asking, uh, I'm just thinking of a question off the top of my head. Can you explain a little bit more uh, what the difference is between an emergency department where you may receive all kinds of acute uh, intensive situations and then I see or an adult critical care unit where uh, you perhaps you've had a bit more preparation you know they're coming up as opposed to the emergency department where they don't know what's what's going on so what's the difference a little bit in the training and in the uh, qualifications of those nurses and those physicians there is a certain common ground which is a critically ill patient the emergency room has a critical care area that is smaller than our ICU and handles people who come in off the street or off, off an ambulance who uh, really are critically ill. I mean, if they were in our ICU, they would fit perfectly. Um, but they, they come off the street. They, they've got to be dealt with immediately right away. So the emergentologists are trained to handle um, patients as we are, 
with an acute problem use usually a, a single problem um, and they're very good at it uh, their specialty is handling the golden hour so to speak after that time if the patient isn't better uh, I'll give you an example someone with severe asthma they can come in very 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 ill and within an hour or two uh, turn around quite nicely and they're a different person so that's one example where you wouldn't necessarily need an ICU um, other other diseases don't necessarily turn around predictably don't turn around quickly so they course deal right away uh, they take care of the airway the breathing the the blood pressure and then they call us and we would like we try to intervene as fast as we can both to help them and to help help, help them by offloading them and continuing the care um, upstairs so th that's that is one thing we have in common of course the emergency room takes care of every the whole spectrum of illness from um, you know, the common cold all the way to, so, so they are trained to handle a wide spectrum of illness, um, but they don't have the um, space, the, um, the, uh, the infrastructure of equipment, nor the um, involvement, the um, investment of, uh, of people, of structure like in our ICU to take care of them for more than an hour or two or three. So I guess that would be one way to separate it. Of course, and if someone became acutely sick from a ward in the hospital, then they can't come down to the emergency room. Once you're admitted, you're admitted. So that would be, we would do, be doing the same thing as the emergentologist was if the patient was coming from home. So if they're in the hospital, they call us right away. So I don't know if that helps. That, that helped me because I was about to run out of questions. So uh, thank you for that. My <laughs> blood pressure started to go up. It's the first time in six years where I didn't get any questions. So again, for the new people here, this is the opportunity where you write down your questions and you pass it over and we are eager to, uh, to get to your questions as well. I will not have 30 minutes worth of questions on my own. But I do have another one before I start to read these. Uh, can you explain DNR, do not resuscitate? How does that factor in to patient care? How does the family make determinations like that? Is it the patient that discusses it ahead of time? Maybe tell us a little bit about that. We see it on uh, all of the medical shows, but not many people really understand what's, what's behind that thinking. Mm. Jackie. DNR. A DNR designation means that if your heart should stop, you do not want to be resuscitated. That's what it means to us. It doesn't mean that you don't get care. It doesn't mean that we don't take care of you when you're sick. It doesn't mean that we just ignore your family. What it means is that you have decided that if your heart should stop beating on its own, you do not want us to perform CPR. Now, there's, there's different grades of DNR, though, too, when you're talking about intensive care unit. At the beginning of the lecture, what we were talking about a little bit was the ICU deals in patients whose illness is reversible. In some people, your illness is not reversible. And that comes to a point where we have to look at the families and say to them, OK, now what? Now what? This person's not going to be able to come off the ventilator. We're not going to be able to fix the arrhythmia that this person has that's life-threatening. This person is dependent on very strong medication to keep their blood pressure high enough for them to be living. Now what? Does this person want to live like this? And that's something about DNR that we, we can all think about, myself included. If there's no hope that I can go back to my previous state of being, for myself, for me, that makes me a DNR. But we all have our own beliefs about this, so we can't get into that gray zone. For nursing, what it means is that we care for the patient and the family with as much respect as possible, with as much limitations as we can, with, no, with as much bearing on the reversibility of the illness and what the patient's wishes are. We don't always have the luxury to know what the patient's wishes are. That's part of the problem. That's why it's so important to talk about DNR first. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, on to a couple of questions from our uh, students here this evening. Uh, two similar ones on infection prevention. How do you uh, prevent infections such as uh, flesh-eating disease, C. difficile, from going from one patient to the other um, while these patients are in the uh, ICU? And after all your hard work, how do you feel 
when something like C. diff strikes and the ICU in the ICU and causes enormous setbacks? How do you deal with that, and right. how do you prevent it? Go ahead. First of all, uh, rest assured that for every infection, there are uh, standards uh, of prevention. So we don't have to invent them every time. These standards come down from the authorities, uh, uh, North American authorities, uh, and they're worked out. For new diseases, when flesh-eating disease became uh, more prominent, uh, these guidelines were a work in progress, and within a number of cases, it, it, it became very clear, and, and we were getting the final uh, directives. So uh, we don't, uh, we're not very, we, we should, no one tries to be creative. The point is to, to work this as a structure so that every patient um, who would surround a, a case uh, with a, an infection or, or whether it's an infection or something that could be to the de detriment of the neighbors, th there is a structure that we, we follow to the letter. And in fact, the infection prevention control uh, officers uh, make sure that uh, everyone, all the staff are informed and we do it the same way. And it's really very rigid and uh, we, we have no choice. So th that's for the p p uh, protection of the public. When Clostridium difficile came, um, that was uh, an infection that we, we learned about as it was happening. And um, like every epidemic, which this really was, um, as it, it starts appearing, you don't actually see it as an epidemic. It, and, and the face uncovers uh, over time and it, it's quite an experience to to realize that we are in we are we're in an epidemic it wasn't as striking and as um, I guess as dramatic as SARS but it was in fact more dangerous and we I think we all know people who have either had CD or, uh, or and survived or not survived it so they're be they're developed with this and that's why I'm saying this there guidelines for how to handle this uh, developed as the authorities got to know these cases. They're all obligatorily reported to the mm -hmm. authorities. They go through every case and they develop a, a very quick knowledge base. These are very smart people. And with their background on communicable diseases, very rapidly make up guidelines that change as the knowledge increases and we get that back right away as a directive. Mm -hmm. So everyone benefits right away, and this, this is law. So if we didn't do that, it would even be against the law. So I, and, and the theme is protection of the public, and of course of the staff, who we happen to be part of the public also. So I, I think that we can rest assured that these things are only mysterious when they're not known, but when, when an infection is known right away, there's a, a procedure. There's also a procedure to deal with the people who were exposed before the disease was known. So these are all fairly well structured and worked out. How do you feel though? How do you feel when a patient, that was part of the question. That's the second part, the okay. second question. How do you feel with all the effort and all the, 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 the achievement, the accomplishment, the studying, the practicing, and then you're whacked with something completely out of the, uh, out of the left field, which is infection? How do you feel about that? Yeah, it certainly highlights that w I think we know more than anyone our limits and, and we uh, have to keep a very close open mind. In fact, when CD Sil came on, there was a lot of denial that there in fact was something going on. Mm -hmm. So it's humbling, but it's a reminder that we're only healthcare providers. We have a lot to learn and there's a lot more we don't know than what we know. We know that, and so when we're cautious about certain things, when we, we seem very conservative, but I think this conservatism and this cautiousness is in the interest of safety. Uh, and it's not to protect our knowledge, it's in fact rather to protect our patients because we feel terrible when our patients don't do well. Yeah. Okay, we'll go on to the next question, and as I'm uh, reading them, I hope that some of you are still writing them. And just as a reminder, the question should be general nature. It's not, you know, I was admitted three weeks ago and they gave me this prescription and I really didn't like the doctor, and <laughs> but the nurse was terrific, the doctor was a lot. So make sure it's general, uh, <laughs> not too specific. If you have a specific problem, talk about your neighbor, not about yourself, and uh, we'll, keep it, uh, we'll keep it like that. So next question, what is the longest time you can keep a patient in the ICU? What are the specific criteria to keep wow. them even longer? Okay, criteria for staying in the ICU is as long as you need an intervention, as long as you need care that cannot be provided on the ward, then you stay in the ICU. For example, if you need a ventilator to breathe, and you only need it at nighttime, though. During the daytime, you're good, right? You're fine. Then you stay in the ICU. 
You can go down to second cup during the day. And don't laugh, we do. <laughs> we do. Oh, I'll take Mr. So-and-so because we're going to go to second. I bought this guy a coffee at second cup. Him and I were so buzzed from this strong coffee. Somebody had over second cupped it. Well, they wanted to know why he was binging off the walls, and, and so was I. Well, you know, but these are the type, this is the human part of, of ICU care. As long as you need something that the, only the ICU can provide, you stay. Basically, that's, that's it. So how long? Our longest patient was with us for 18 months, I think. And what a lady she was. Wow. Yeah, amazing. Amazing. So we get, we get tight with our patients. We really do. We used to go in, do her hair, fix her up. Yeah. Did she recover? In many ways, she did. How's that? That's kind of a background answer. Yeah. Okay, so uh, a related question from one of our uh, four-time returning students here. Uh, the nurses may have eight or ten patients. I guess he was doing some quick math. How many patients might the nurses uh, be looking after? And if so, and if they're so ill, how do they take care of so many at the same time ah. when they're so ill? Nurses have one to two patients max, maximum. The more toys you have attached to your patient, so the more equipment, like what you saw outside, you can have all of the equipment that I had outside, you can have on one patient. That patient gets one nurse. One nurse, one patient for somebody who has all that stuff on him. Otherwise, we can have one to two patients. That's fine. It works. How do we do it? Prioritizing. Um, we have excellent health. We have excellent PAVs, um, orderlies, beneficiary attendants. We have a lot of nursing students. That's how we do it. And we all have really good training and good support, and we help each other. Okay, I'm going to let one personal note slip through the cracks here. It says, my son is a pulmonary ICU, ICU specialist. It's not an easy profession, as he's on call 24 hours a day. Without the nurses, it would be impossible. So I'm going to let you read the handwriting after it. I know your mother's here, so that might be your mom, but... Is that you? <laughs> if it's legible, it's not hers. Oh, okay. <laughs> it wasn't a plug then. Okay, another question. <laughs> What is the percentage of patients that are admitted to ICU that recover completely? Ooh, I don't know. A lot. Some people yeah. recover when they leave the ICU. Some people recover uh, while in the hospital. And some people take months to recover. Recovery starts off by that twinkle in the eye. Mm -hmm. it, it, and it doesn't take a healthcare provider. Usually families see it mm -hmm. first. And that's the beginning. Yeah. Unfortunately, then the body has to follow. That's longer. But the twinkle in the eye, the attitude, um, starting to feel hungry, less swollen. Uh, so it's really a continuum. And uh, so being cured from your disease is one thing, and healing from the ordeal that your body was through is another. So it really is a, it's a process, and it's, it's a process like any other terrible experience or extreme experience, and so it's very hard to put a number. We, we have very um, insufficient date information on outcome after ICU, and it's because of this continuum, it depends what people measure. If you want a quick number, uh, we, we have about a 12% mortality in ICU, and those who leave ICU, another about 8 to 10% uh, don't survive the hospital. But these numbers are relatively meaningless because it depends on how they've been healing, where they were at, and, and whether you live or die may not even have to do directly with the processes of care. So there, it's, it's not simple, but I think once you, once you think of having recovered from even a very bad cold and pneumonia, I think you can remember the phases that, that you left behind as you got better. And so the sicker you are, the more you have to take, take these peels off before you feel well. But you do, people do say they're feeling well, and then a month later they say, they say I'm feeling better, and they don't realize how, how much more healing uh -huh. there is. But someone who had, for example, the bad pneumonia I showed you, could um, leave the ICU after two weeks, could leave the hospital after another couple weeks, and then um, have not be able to return to work for the next six months. 
because of it can be called depression but it's really a lot more the whole body needs months to heal from something like that so that gives you an idea okay uh, tell us a little bit about the capacity the space within the ICU I know there's ICU 1 ICU 2 mm -hmm. maybe explain a little bit about the capacity you told us there's about 15 uh, on average uh, admissions uh, 18 is a, a bit of a surge what are there busy seasons when it comes to an ICU what is like a super busy time how do you deal with uh, the space considerations okay we have two physical units um, ICU 1 and ICU 2 they're both on the third floor above us uh, they're down the hall from each other. One holds a capacity of 12 beds. The other one holds a capacity of 10 beds. Why two physical spaces? Well, we just couldn't figure out how to take over the entire corridor, basically. That was it. Somebody just erased that part of the plan. Um, we have between 15 and 18 patients. Usually it's, it's about 14, 15. Um, that has a lot to do with the nursing shortage right now. There's a big shortage of nurses in Canada and, and nationwide, including the states. Uh, there's also a, a huge shortage of critical care nurses. So when a nurse comes out of the nursing school, they have to hone their skills a little bit. They need to be able to work on patients who are less acutely ill, but they need to work still in order to get their practice. And then they're ready to come to the ICU. So it takes them a little while. Um, when we're talking about capacity, one thing that we have to remember in the ICU is that if somebody's really, really sick, one nurse, one patient. If we have five patients who are extremely ill, one nurse, one patient, then I can't take that many more, right? I've got one nurse, one patient, five of my nurses are taken up for that. And then the rest of my patients can be two, patients for one nurse, that works. What happens if condition changes? So that changes me again. So I can only run, I guess, as many as, many as I have. Um, what else can I add to that? Okay, well that leads into the next question. What happens when you have too many? Uh, is there an eligibility or how do you choose who is admitted and who isn't? And if they're not admitted, well where do they go? Because I guess if they have to go there, yeah. they have to go. So yeah. how do you deal with that? When you have too many, I work overtime. <laughs> That's what happens. Um, you want to start that one? Start that question. We never have enough room uh, or manpower for the need. So the, uh, the, the choice, the word triage has been used, uh, is based on a number of factors. Uh, the, immediate, the immediacy, if there are two patients who uh, both r would, r would benefit from ICU, uh, is the one who is the, 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 more, the most unstable, uh, who has some uh, judgment that th they will benefit from being stabilized. So you've got to, first of all, be sicker, unstable, and have some, some at least estimate that you can actually do something positive, that you can turn them around, and that this, this, all this exercise will have been worthwhile to stabilizing the patient and to, to afterwards. The more unstable, the, the, the less time we have to start asking for what are the values and the goals of the patient, and we certainly will err on the side of, of treating rather than not treating. Mm -hmm. um, once you stabilize someone, you have at least a chance to now go into the person's values and to consider that. Um, but, but certainly the, um, the, uh, more the, 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 the less stable the person, the more their status has changed from their baseline. Uh, they, they will go in first, and that will sometimes cancel uh, an elective surgery. And as someone who needs major surgery, who would have needed to come to the ICU because it was a heart surgery or major surgery that needs to come to us, and we go, th we go through that every day. Uh, in, on the Montreal Island, this is a, a, a current uh, uh, issue that has reached the uh, regional authorities, and we're, we're on a committee that looks at this now. So let's say that we're not unique. Uh, and uh, we're trying to find ways to uh, handle this, this issue that, is, that has occurred now where uh, scheduled surgery, elective surgery, is, is at risk uh, more and more often for people with uh, uh, emergency uh, diseases.
And that leads into the next question about planning for things like pandemic. Uh, for those of us that were here the last couple of years, we mm -hmm. heard from Dr. Andre Dascal, uh, a specialist in infectious diseases, telling us it's not a matter of if the next outbreak, mm -hmm. the next pandemic uh, takes place. It's just a matter of when. So we hear about uh, SARS five years ago. Uh, we hear about uh, avian flu these last couple of years. How do you plan in the case of an ICU for a major outbreak of that sort? Okay. Yes, please do. Okay. That's a little easier, surprisingly, because Health Canada, um, just like the, uh, the Americans and other uh, authorities, have set up uh, m multiple committees and they've come with a, a, a package, a, a, pl a pandemic plan uh, that involves a triage. Um, who gets what and who doesn't get what? So this is one situation where you have the uh, ability and obligation to uh, designate who gets something a little like military triage. It's much easier in that case because you're, you're under certain guidances, so all elective surgery gets canceled. Okay, Every elective, uh, someone who's scheduled to get a CT scan will not get a CT scan unless there's an emergency issue. And, and uh, there is always a little fine tuning at that time. There, there's, there's the acute patients in between who uh, are not that bad, but they're not that well either. But let's say that there is a structure in case of a pandemic that will guide us just like when we have an infection uh, that takes over more of our resources that there are, are plans that we will have to follow. Like uh, C-Diff? Like Le Cidum um, so, so there was one for, for SARS, they had to create it because of course they didn't really have a preparedness plan but for uh, influenza because of that I think everyone has been much more uh, and so at the Quebec level the Quebec plan is uh, really tailored off the Canadian plan so that's yeah. taken care of. We may not always agree with it, but uh, uh, epidemics are estimated to last a certain period of time, and the whole structure is premised around how long it will last, the impact, and other people have worried about this, and I think we have to carry through that knowing that it's temporary. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we've got five minutes left and about three or four questions, so we can take one or two more if you're... Uh, inspired to uh, write down your question. Uh, next is, what is the single biggest challenge faced by the staff in the ICU? Uh, for you, Jane. Uh, for nursing, the single biggest challenge is to take care of our patients the way that we would want to be taken care of ourselves, bearing in mind that we don't have all the resources that we would want and we would need. We don't have enough staff. We don't have enough time. We can't give you enough time. There's never enough for us because we want to. We're, we're caring, helping professionals. We want to be able to give. There's never enough for us, and that's our biggest challenge: to be able to give the care that we would want to be able to give. And I'll, I'll preface it also by saying that the ICU nurses are a dynamic super group. They really give good nursing care. I'm proud to be part of them but it's never enough for them because they always want to be able to give more. Dr. Laporte, you want to take a shot yeah. at that one? Well, then there's the patients who are not in the ICU who would benefit, and that's uh, one of our challenges is we constantly have in our, in our minds the, the, the knowledge that there's someone who's waiting to come who uh, didn't get admitted at the time where it would have been ideal. There had to be a delay because de had taking that person would have uh, challenged someone else's outcome who was being treated. And we're constantly, just so you be aware, the, the, the rights of the people in the ICU are relative to those who should be in the ICU. And you don't have any God-given right just because you're in the ICU that you sit there. So this triaging, the, 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 this, we place everything on the table in our own minds regularly and we keep shuffling to try to be as fair and just as possible. This involves not only our opinion, but the opinion of the teams who are requesting that their patient come in. And it's, it's a lot of work. I would say that half of my time when I'm on service is taking care or considering the cases of people who are not in the ICU. And during that time, of course, we're not caring for our patients in the unit, but it's reached a point where we're as much out of the ICU as in the ICU. 
Okay. What has been the biggest uh, challenge, the, uh, sorry, what has been the biggest technological change that has radically assisted patients in the ICU? The biggest technological change. Well, you've been here mm. since 1984. So since 1984, what has been the <laughs> biggest technological change? Mm, bow to wisdom. Mm. <laughs> I think our ability to um, ventilate people expertly uh, the ventilators you saw are iron lungs. They're fairly dumb machines, so to speak. They did the job for a very simple problem when the muscles don't work because the, the nerves are infected. Um, the patients now are much more complicated and, and the ventilators, they require a much more sophisticated and it allows us to try to keep their time with life support as short as possible. And I think uh, the the, and the, the, the quality of our vascular device, airway device machines is such that if we can turn them around fast, okay, they don't get infected, they don't get complications from them. So I would say that the, mm -hmm. the, the, um, the quality of, of the equipment we have now is so good that if we, can, if we play it right, we're able to keep their time on a respirator even shorter than than before. The fact they stay, we have more patients staying longer is just because the diseases are more numerous when they come in, so it's catching up. So at the end of it all, some people stay longer, but that's despite the, the excellent quality and of course the, the training that uh, people have gotten, of course, to master these, this equipment. Okay. And uh, what, what, as a visionary, what would you say still needs to be invented, changed, and worked on within the ICU? Perhaps things that are coming down the line that exist uh, maybe in the States or in Europe that you see coming in the next five or ten years to change the ICU even more and improve the quality of life for patients? Wow. These are the, great questions. These are great questions. These are great students. Yeah, they really are. They're visionaries. Oh, they are visionaries. Um, the simplest things such as electronic charting, um, there's a lot of documentation that goes on in the ICU, lots from, from all of the professionals. And to be able to change it to voice recognition technology where all you have to do is, is a few little keystrokes, a few little words, that the whole patient picture comes out. Something avant-garde with that would be amazing. More technical. Um, different types of mechanical hearts, ventricular assist devices where patients who have a heart that's been damaged by heart attacks, by um, failure, just too much work on the muscle, that we can actually offer them a way to rest their heart. The same way we can rest somebody's lungs by putting a breathing tube in and offering them mechanical ventilation. If we can do that with their heart, how amazing could it be? I, I agree with all of this. I, I think, however, that Turning people into a whole bunch of bionic pieces is hopefully no. not. No, I'm, I'm not saying this cynically, but I'm saying that with that with that caricature or that or that expectation that technologically we're, there's no limit to how far we could carry the human being uh, is certainly something that that is happening and and that's fine. But what I would say is the would be the real gift is that um, the ability of informatics the ability of, um, of being able to incorporate immediately into our practice any new information that's published. Mm -hmm. you know, these things don't happen very well right now. It's just been the way it's occurred in medicine. Uh, so we can quickly turn around or improve our practice immediately as new information comes and recognize that um, the way we work uh, should be changed um, always made better and better, accepting that um, to make five steps to go from A to B has got to be made better into two steps. And right now, the realization that this is like gravy, this is considered, well, this is artsy stuff, but, but work engineering um, uh, is, is a science, and if that can be incorporated, then the same people can do more. And by doing more, we're saying coming back to the bedside. Whenever we do this, we realize that we can't get away from the bedside. We have to, st the pictures you saw, that's where the action is. Our action is with the patient, mm -hmm. and we got to touch them, we got to see them, we got to feel them. And, and all this technology, if it doesn't help us do that, is going to get us further and further away from our art.
Okay, we're going to go into the speed round now. We have one minute left. I'm going to see if I can get through as many questions as possible in a minute, and the rest, I promise you, we'll put up on the website. So okay. first of all, what criteria is considered whether or not to evaluate if a patient is worth intubating in the first place? How do you determine who gets intubated and who doesn't? Go. Well, the word, the, the word <laughs> worth is already a judgment, yeah. um, but it, it, the word captures um, risk, benefit, or burden benefit and part of it is first of all defining what is the what is the process that's occurred that even puts you in this situation and the clearer that is the, the more you you have a sense of the context that what's the chance of, for example this pneumonia okay what's the chance of this pneumonia getting better and you start off with a framework that if you take a hundred people with this kind of process and now if you add diabetes, you add this, you add this, you add this, the picture is a little more variable, a little less predictable, but you have to have a frame of context. And I, and I think that all these decisions have, are, are very dependent on the context, and that's where I think the expertise, the experience, as the person's advocate, we have to bring forth that and say, look, this is the context that I see, okay? From what we know, from what we read, from what we've done, there is, a, there is such and such a chance that this will go this way, that way, okay? How does that ring with your values? Okay, and if someone says, I don't want to be in bed for three months, or I, I don't want to take six months to go back to work, if I can't get better in the next month, okay, well, this is a radical approach, but the point is to be able to proactively engage with the person or the person's surrogates, the family, that this is what I see, this is what we see, and this is what we see this happening probably. How probably? So, so that's why the, the worth is defined partly by the context, by our best opinion, mm -hmm. and then balanced with the values okay, of, the, of the person who's going through this or their surrogate decision makers. It has to be done. Okay, I'm already breaking my promise by going over by a minute or two. We're gonna squeeze through two very quick questions. It is the speed round. What is the cost implicated or involved in keeping someone in an ICU on a per day basis? Short question, short $3, answer. $3, How many? $3,000 a day. $3,000 per day, wow. Canadian. Cana we're all, well, U.S., Canadian. <laughs> we're paying for it. Last question, if you need to buy new equipment, where does the money come from? How long does it take to get? Oh, Here's it the takes pitch a for long the time. Um, it's thanks to generous donors that we have a lot of our equipment. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't always come like this. We have to do a lot of work to get it. If we have to buy something new, we have to, if it's going through the Quebec government, we have to go through the regulatory bodies that govern the hospital, that provide us with our budgets. We have to make an official request, and then the request has to be examined, and it has to be on a, a, ben a risk-benefit type of ratio. And then we get our denial, and then we reply again, and then we get our denial, and we reply again. And then it goes to foundation, and we beg, and we try and find somebody to cover it. And Sometimes we're very, for, usually we're very fortunate. We're very lucky. We're out of time. Let's give a big round of applause and thank you. Thank you. You're great. Thank you. You're great. The first class is out, but make sure you come back next week for Will You Still Feed Me? Do You Still Need Me? When I'm 64, 74, 84, Perspectives on Aging. We'll see you next week. You did a good job, Jack. I'm sorry about that. We'll cut it out and the eventually. <laughs> Normally we show it to you before and I'm sorry. That's okay. I wouldn't have had time to look at it. Today. It was it was uh, yeah,
She's your daughter. The two of you, one face. So your mother's telling me that I'm wonderful. 